Welcome to Nature Bats Last on the Progressive Radio Network. It's NBL on PRN.FM. This September 1st, 2020 edition, episode 142 of Nature Bats Last, comes to you pre-recorded from Central Florida in the United States. This is Guy McPherson, and I'm joined, as often happens, by guest host Pauline Schneider. Regular co-host Kevin Hester is indisposed today, although he graciously, graciously submitted ideas and questions for today's guest. Pauline, will you introduce our guest today? I'd be very happy to. We are really delighted to have Dr. Morris Berman on the show today. And you can find his blog at Morris Berman, spelled M-O-R-R-I-S-B-E-R-M-A-N, dot blogspot dot com where he's been blogging since May of 2006. Dr. Berman is well known as an innovative cultural historian and social critic. He has taught at a number of universities in Europe and North America and has held visiting endowed chairs at Incarnate World College in San Antonio, Texas, the University of New Mexico in Albuquerque, and Weber State University in Ogden, Utah. During 1982-88, he was the Lansdowne Professor in the History of Science at the University of Victoria, British Columbia. Berman was awarded the Governor's Writers Award for Washington State in 1990. He was the first recipient of the Rollo May Center Grant for Humanistic Studies in 1992. And he was awarded the Neil Postman Award for Career Achievement in Public Intellectual Activity from the Media Ecology Association in 2013. He is the author of a trilogy of the evolution of human consciousness, recognized as one of the best works of cultural history, the Consciousness Trilogy. He, <clears throat> he also wrote the American Decline Trilogy, which is among the best works of political history. In 2000, his Twilight of American Culture was named a notable book by the New York Times Book Review. Dr. Berman relocated to Mexico in 2006 and during 2008-2009 was a visiting professor at the Tecnológico de Monterrey, Mexico City. His latest collection of short stories was released as a book on May 29, 2020. It is titled The Heart of the Matter and Dr. Berman, welcome to Nature Bats Last on the Progressive Radio Network, and that's our show for today. <laughs> well, I'm glad we can wrap this up. <laughs> Your blog. I didn't have that much to say anyway. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think we just said it all. <laughs> Professor Berman, okay. you're. Okay, you're talking next month. <laughs> Your blog, Dark Ages America, can be found at Boris, morrisberman.blogspot.com. You refer to your blog readers as wafers. Please enlighten us regarding that term and how it arose. Yeah, well, um, you know, one thing I should say is that um, it has nothing to do with uh, Catholicism, transubstantiation, or the host. It's not that wafer. Um, it's... Uh, the name was derived from the third book in my American Empire trilogy, which is called Why America Failed. So if you take the first three letters, the first letter of each Why? word, W-A-F. So wafers are folks on the blog who enjoyed the book and just want to have discussions about the um, ongoing collapse of the American Empire. That's great, and I actually followed your blog for many years after I left active service at the University of Arizona. So at one point I knew that, but that was a while ago. You've been blogging for a very long time. Yeah, April, April 2006 was when I was forced into it by my then editor at Norton and my then uh, agent in San Francisco uh, who said that I simply had to do it, and I didn't want to. I don't like to spend a lot of time online, but uh, as time went on, uh, they were right. It was the right thing to do because it's uh, created a kind of oasis for people who realize that the United States is simply nuts. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and the, mm -hmm. the comment I most frequently get 
uh, whether it's from people reading books or the blog, wherever they come out from, is I thought I was crazy until I read X. It's the most frequent comment I've had in my professional career. And it's because things are upside down and everybody um, in the United States, 330 million people, just go along with it and take it for reality. Mm -hmm. When in fact, uh, it, it's reality inverted. You know, there's a great Sufi story of this guy who um, is up in the clouds and he's going to descend to earth and live among the earth people. And uh, when he descends, he takes a collection of water and he's told, don't drink the water supply of the people on earth. Just drink from your own supply mm -hmm. because the people on earth are nuts. <laughs> and so he, he does that. He quite, you know, he won't touch any of the water, but he can't understand any of the people and they can't understand him. Uh -huh. And he's really lonely and finally he gives in, especially when his own water supply runs out, he gives in and he drinks the water that everybody else is drinking. And you know what? All of a sudden they're friends with him and he makes sense and they make sense. But basically he lost reality. That was the price of it. Mm -hmm. And, um, that Sufi story became the skeleton of a wonderful novel by Doris Lessing called Briefing for a Descent into Hell, uh, which is based on that theme. And the question is, I mean, I don't assume with my blog or my writings I'm going to change very much in the real world, but oh, my goal is just to fish a few people out of the drink. But I've done that. I've done that. And the blog is a kind of oasis for people who have come to the conclusion that the United States is simply upside down. Yeah. And they see that now for the first time, and the sense of relief that they have in their lives is absolutely enormous. And, you know, so looking back, my agent and editor were right. It was the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That, that reminds me so much of um, when George Bush <laughs> was described as a president you'd want to have a beer with. And I don't know that I want my leader to be someone I want to have a beer with, but I definitely want my, my leader of my country to be someone who's wise enough to not get us into, you know, wars that are of choice. And I mean, do you remember when he said that, when people were talking about that? And in fact, that was yeah, a... And, and people that were interviewed uh, you know, very pro-Bush, this in 2000, said, he's just an ordinary person yeah. just like you and me. Yeah. <laughs> and why would you want somebody who was just like yourself to right. be president? Right. You know, exactly. When John Kerry was running for president, he had to hide the fact that he was fluent in French. Yeah. Because the American public would not like that. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 yeah, it is upside down. There's no doubt about it. Yeah. I mean, and but... But now we have probably the most upside down version of it. We have a, a you know, reality show slash comedian at the helm. And I don't think, I mean, I, I know we knew he was going to be bad, but we, I don't think we had any idea. I don't, th I know I didn't. I, I mean, I knew he would be bad, but I mean, they're always bad. <laughs> they don't ever get better. <laughs> Franklin Roosevelt. Yeah. Right, right. <laughs> but the only exception was Jimmy Carter. Jimmy, Jimmy Carter saw the world correctly. I mean, the rest of the presidents have just carried on the yeah. upside down yeah. uh, framework. But, um, you know, in early August, uh, there was this interview that our president did with Jonathan Swan of Axios. Yes, I was going to ask if you saw that. <laughs> Yeah, he embarrassed himself so dramatically that, I mean, there was for all to see. The president of the United States was a jackass. Yeah. That, there was no getting around it. He was a moron. Yeah. And, and it was there for all to see. The only thing is that I'm betting you that his base, which is like 40% of the voting population, mm -hmm. uh, who bothered to look at that interview, said, well, that was great. He did a terrific job. I mean, he really stood up to that guy. Because that's all they can see, the yeah. world upside down, you know. Right. Yeah, when, when, 
Yeah, when up is down and right is left and green is yellow. Yeah, heroes are villains, you know, all that sort of stuff. Yeah, it's it's ma it's maddening that that interview is that the most recent interview that he did the end of July was stunning, absolutely stunning, and I felt You're like talking about the, the, the one with uh, Axios. Yes, jo I felt like yeah. Jonathan. I mean, it was hard to believe. It was hard to believe that this could actually be uh, the national representative. So yeah. Just I mean, you looked, you looked at this guy, and he was a complete horse's ass. And, yeah. and you, you know, I mean, uh, it, it was jaw-dropping. Yeah. A man-baby, as many call it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's so, it, and it's so discouraging because the alternative? What do you think of our, it's our, a, our a, quote? A senile, a senile clown. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. And, uh, and uh, Biden has already said that if he's elected, nothing's going to change. Uh, okay. He doesn't have any plans to change anything, you know, so we will just revert right. to the Obama years where we were treading water yeah. and nothing at all was accomplished. Right. So I've been asking people, would you prefer a racist rapist or do you want to vote in Trump again? <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, we were looking at the... Um, the Green Party um, candidate, Howie Hawkins. What do you think about him? Have you have you looked into him at all? I haven't. I remember the last Green candidate I remember was Jill Stein. Right. And I think Jill got like one percent, if that. Yeah. Of the vote, you know. Right. And that's where uh, there are such great differences to my mind between, let's say, the United States and Western Europe. Yes. Western Europe has flourishing green parties. Yes. That have representatives in parliament, you know, and people who understand um, the threat to the environment that our way of life poses. Whereas, you know, I mean, you can blame your leader, our leaders all you want, but in fact, the, the fact that Jill Stein gets 1% of the vote tells mm -hmm. you something about where the heads are yes. of the American people. Exactly. You know, yeah. they're not, you know, I, I always got a kick out of that line from um, the comedian George Carlin. Uh, May he rest in peace, and I'm hoping he's looking down on us today. <laughs> um, who once said, where do you think our, our leaders come from? Mars? Right. <laughs> you know, exactly. I mean, they're part of the fabric of, you know, I mean, we elect who we are. Yeah. Yes. So, you know, the fact that that leading figures don't care about the environment is just a reflection of the fact that most Americans don't care about the environment. Yeah. And the most uh, that Jill Stein could gather was 1% of the vote. And I'm presuming that will be the case with a new candidate. Yeah, of course, of course, and and in this country, it's all or nothing. So in other countries, if the Green right. Party, for example, gets ten percent of the vote, they get to have ten percent of the parliamentarians as a consequence. Right. And in this yeah, country, right. it's just an all or none situation, which is too bad. Yeah, our, our I think our system is really is our system is upside down, and I would I would love to see the people of this country demand a, a, a more equitable system. I mean, women aren't represented, African Americans aren't represented, the Latino vote isn't represented, and all of the different factions, I mean, you know, we we have socialists, we have anarchists in this country, and they're, none, of the, none of their voices are represented, and they're valid. <laughs> you know, least of all Native Americans. Right! Yes. <laughs> Sorry, I left I them out. Represent <laughs> yeah. the only true Alternative vision, right? Of America, yeah. yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so it's it's a. I think it, we're in living in some very interesting times right now. And as a historian, I mean, you might say, yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah right. <laughs> and may you get the attention of your government. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, definitely. So we have a lot of questions written down that um, are our our cohort Kevin Hester has written and I'm going through them and they're a little bit out of order for me right now but um, it's just 
you know, it, it, it follows with sort of what we're talking about. This, you know, the the world is having this this terrible economic crisis caused by this pandemic, and we have not seen a pandemic like this in a hundred years. And I'm just wondering what your thoughts might be on, you know, I mean, like the U.S. obviously has completely, you know, fumbled this ball absolutely from the get-go. Um, and we've seen other countries do a much better job and others not do a good job either. But what do you think, what do you think causes countries to do a better job or a worse job at this? Well, I, I really think that the uh, crucial issue is whether you're centralized or deregulated. Mm -hmm. um, that deregulation, uh, privatization, that those things don't work, uh, mm -hmm. have shown up in the health industry now in a dramatic way. Yeah. Um, everybody, whether we're talking about the man, woman in the street or um, uh, somebody in government, uh, everybody is sort of going their own way with regard to the pandemic. Mm -hmm. Whereas in those countries that have gotten on top of it and flattened the curve, you have some degree of group consciousness and uh, governmental or community cooperation. We don't have that. Our ideology is radical individualism. Right. Um, I mean, the most extreme uh, case that I ran across was a number of years ago, and I, I think it was a member of the New Orleans City Council, but I don't think it was, you know, the governor or the mayor or anything like that, I, or senators. I, I think it was somebody on the uh, uh, New Orleans City Council. Uh, none, no work has been done to repair the levees in the wake of mm. Katrina in 2005. Uh, you would think that would be a top priority. Yeah. And this guy was quoted as saying, well, in order to repair the levees, we would have to have uh, a group or community effort to do that. We would have to have collaboration, and that's communism. Right, <laughs> exactly. That's, yeah, so Does God forbid we... Does it get more stupid than that? <laughs> does it get more stupid than that? Yes, it you does. Know? Oh, and so... Uh, <laughs> Basically, countries that understand that you have to work together to get anything done yeah. uh, have succeeded in flattening the curve to more or less uh, various successful results, mm -hmm. whereas the United States is number one in disaster. Mm -hmm. And the president's response to this uh, in, in that uh, Axios interview was something along the lines of, well, it is what it is. Yeah. I mean, that's what he said. Yeah. Absolutely no consciousness that you have to work together to, to do this. And uh, as well as saying, I really don't give a damn about the suffering of the American people. Mm -hmm. You know, tough luck for them. Yeah. You know, that, was, that was essentially what he was saying. Mm -hmm. So in such a situation, uh, we can't really get on top of it, and we're going to remain number one. In, uh, in terms of pandemic disasters uh, for quite a while, yeah. I think. Well, and he responded to the idea of trying to figure out how to help people through the pandemic economically. He said he didn't want to incentivize people or de-incentivize them from working. What is that? Yeah, well, <laughs> yeah it's, an old, it's an old right wing argument. You know, that yes. People should pull themselves up by their bootstraps, ignoring the fact that they don't have any boots. Right, <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. You, I think you would agree that there has never been a better time to be a social critic, especially with respect to the fragmented states of America. So what's your top target for criticism today, and how are your thoughts on that target shaped by your history, your personal history as a historian? all that I've just said, my target is not Donald Trump. Uh, for It is for the mainstream cold liberal media uh, that don't miss a day without excoriating him. But with the exception of very few uh, social critics, I mean, I'm talking about like two or three, um, 
they they seem to believe that the problem is Trump, and once you get him out of office and get Biden in there, everything's going to be just fine, ignoring the fact that things were not just fine during the Obama administration. In fact, it was a disaster. And so somehow, if we just get rid of Trump, you know, so that's their focus. Mm -hmm. The exception that I mentioned, the two or three um, writers uh, who I think have half a brain, I've pointed out that this guy is an icon of the United States. The mm. problem is not Trump, it's Trumpism. Yeah. You have, as, as George Carlin said, where do you think he came from? In the third volume of that trilogy I did on uh, the American Empire, which is called Why America Failed, and hence Wafers, mm. um, I, I mean, in, in that uh, volume, uh, I... I lost, sorry, I lost my train of thought. Um, so you have, right, what I say is, or what I demonstrate is, that from the late 16th century, when you had people coming over from England to settle the American continent, um, the guiding theme was hustling. It was opportunism, and it was making money. And this is finally institutionalized in the Declaration of Independence, because everybody in the late 18th century understood that pursuit of happiness meant go out and get yours, which is exactly what the founding fathers did. They, none of them died poor, that's for sure. So the, the thing is that if the theme is, is uh, hustling all along, um, where do you think we're going to wind up? You know, I mean, um, this, is, this is the situation that we're in right now, and it's our value system. And it's not working out very well. Um, so my my uh, target, I mean, I'm not really writing another book about the United States. I, I don't think I'll do that again. Not much more to be said. But um, <laughs> my target is not Trump per se. It's a whole constellation mm -hmm. of, of way of life and a way of thinking, and particularly uh, the American people. Mm -hmm. um, I, I'm a follower of George Carlin. I'm a follower mm -hmm. of H. L. Mencken, and this is my historical tradition into which I would, into the, the mix, I would throw Gore Vidal mm -hmm. as well. Um, you know, Gore read um, the second volume of my trilogy, uh, uh, Dark Ages America, and he wrote a long review of it, of what the United States was using that book. A couple of days later, he. Um, was in Toronto and he did an interview with the Globe and Mail and he said in that interview, we're a nation of morons and then he said stupidity excites me. <laughs> now, I feel the same way. <laughs> when I see, you know, on the blog, people send in these YouTube videos of Karens. You know the Karens? Yes. Oh, yes. <laughs> the, Karens go, the Karens go to Walmart mm -hmm. and the manager of Walmart says you have to wear a mask. You have mm -hmm. to wear a you know uh, mask covering your mouth and nose and so mm -hmm. on. And they don't put on a mask. What they do is start yelling at him. Yeah. In one case, a woman took everything in her shopping cart and threw it all over the yep. the store yep. while she was screaming and yelling. In another case, I don't know if it was Walmart. It might have been uh, when she was told to put on a mask. The woman dropped her panties and peed on the floor. Oh, now, I have to tell you, I can't get enough of this. <laughs> I think it's absolutely yes. yeah. wonderful. Yeah. And I agree with Gore Vidal that stupidity excites me. Yeah. It is. It's exciting. Here you watch the disintegration of an entire culture on video. What yeah. culture ever had that opportunity, really? Rome yeah. certainly didn't, you know. Well, I can tell you were inspired by <laughs> Carlin. It was Carlin who said that he looks forward to chaos. It gives us something to focus on, and that's the behavior of people, especially in American people, in response to any minor, seemingly insignificant disruption in everyday life. Yeah. Short fuses. That's where we're at. Yeah. These people have short fuses. Well, yeah. I mean, <laughs> they idealize someone with a short fuse. I mean, and what do you do with a population, 38% of which says they're not going to drink 
a Corona beer because it might be related <laughs> right. to the virus. Right. Yeah. What do you do with a population? <laughs> right. What future could a, a country that has this in it, or where 30% believe the sun revolves around the earth, yeah. or where 65% don't believe in evolution, what future could such a country possibly have? It's yeah. stunning we made it this far to me. So, so you, so you would, would you agree that Trump is our Nero? Uh, yeah, they would be, maybe Caligula. You know? Caligula, <laughs> but but he can't play the violin, uh, so. <laughs> that, yeah, that's true. He can, yeah, right. He doesn't but, have any real uh, talent. I mean, I mean, Trump is not the, my target, and he should yeah. not. He is the target of the mainstream media, but he shouldn't be because no, he right. represents. I mean, he's a bore. He's a jackass. He knows nothing. And that pretty much summarizes where the American people are at. Absolutely. He is representing the people. Absolutely. We, this country got what it wanted. By the way, where are you living now? Are you still in Mexico? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, um, I live, I used to, before the virus, I divided my time between Mexico City, which is absolutely wonderful, and mm -hmm. uh, a small town a few hours out where I am now. Uh -huh. And um, I've been holed up here because the statistics for, um, virus statistics for Mexico City are the highest in the entire country. Yeah, they're bad. And the virus statistics for where I am are among the lowest mm -hmm. in the country. So it's safe to stay here. Yeah. But, you know, it's a kind of, I mean, I, I can I can go out and walk around. People do that, you yeah. know, and I, I I try to do that every day. But it's um, you know, it's a lockdown situation. I might try my luck in September, and go back to Mexico City for a few weeks, just to see if I can avoid the virus and have a good time. You know, I miss all my friends. They're basically located in Mexico City. Yeah. Do you, and 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 you have a ma There's a mask rule there, right? Yeah. Um, I don't know to what extent people are observing in Mexico City. Here in this town, it's about 50%. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, there are signs around saying you must wear yeah. a uh, cubreboca, uh, you know, face mm -hmm. mask. You have to do that. But about half the people in the street don't wear one. Um, the one the place where you don't have a choice is like if you enter, excuse me, if you enter a 7-Eleven, you have to put one on. Right. Because as in case of Walmart, they'll tell you, excuse me, sorry, you know, you can't come in without face right. mask. And nobody, may I uh, say, is responding by urinating on the floor. <laughs> <laughs> so they're just taking it on the chin, in other words. They aren't even fighting back. <laughs> right. right. Uh, we were your neighbors. Well, Mexico has more of a group consciousness. Yeah. You know what I mean? I mean, the family, yeah. community. Right. Those things are still big down here, and it's the primary reason that I moved down here. Yeah. You know, I was sick and tired of living in an alienated world where I had nobody to talk to and um, where the world was upside down, and mm -hmm. I was like the, the guy in the Sufi tale yeah. uh, who was running out of water and saying, you know, either I leave or I drink the water, you know. Yeah. We, we lived in Belize for two and a half years. I grew up in Greece. So oh, no kidding. we have some perspective of what it's like to not be in an upside down country. Yeah. 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 We escaped yeah. for a time. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, I'm Greek American, so I was, I was very fortunate to grow up overseas. I got to see what it's, what it's like to live in a country with universal health care and, you know, educated people who don't argue about the uh, evolution. <laughs> <laughs> and the earth being round, <laughs> things like that. <laughs> one, of my, one, of the, one of the short stories in my uh, most recent book, uh, The Heart of the Matter, is the title is Anaximenes. And uh, it's, about, it's about a guy who works for the Met and thinks he has discovered a manuscript of Anaximenes, which would be like uh, 5th century BC. Uh -huh. uh, that plagi that pa Plato plagiarized, you know. Yeah, right. And so uh, he gets very excited, and uh, the Met buys this manuscript. Turns out to be a fake. He gets fired, and he can only get a job chopping vegetables in a Greek restaurant on the Upper West Side. <laughs> and every once in a while, 
uh, he's so fed up that he screams, Isoi ine anguri, which means <laughs> life is a cucumber. <laughs> yes. and, and the rest of the proverb is, life is a cucumber, and the rest of the proverb is, some taste it and are refreshed, others have to stretch. <laughs> so he concludes that he took a cucumber up the ass with That's... the manuscript. <laughs> <laughs> so, Let's not go there. <laughs> that's your latest book, in fact. It's actually, it's actually a very funny book. That's great. I recommend it to people caught in lockdown. Because if you want a few laughs now, you might need it. Yes, definitely. So that's that's your latest <laughs> book. As we pointed out, the heart of the matter. It's a collection of fictional short stories. Can you tell us a little more about what's in there? Yeah. Um, the. Uh, uh, I mean, a lot of a lot of it is deliberately humorous. Uh, there's a, there's a one story in which, um, uh, as an experiment, a thousand people are locked in a wire cage, and a guy outside stands with a uh, megaphone, and he announces certain words. He says things like, he shouts, feminism, or Muslims, or diversity. Mm-hmm. And with each word, the crowd goes nuts. <laughs> you know, they simply go, it's so politically incorrect that they go crazy. And they start, you know, biting each other and beating their heads against the wall. Stuff like this. You know, so it's sort of like, there, there, are, a lot of, there are a lot of funny stories in it like that. That's and, great. Um, I thought you the, said it was fiction. That, <laughs> right. I thought you said... <laughs> yeah, yeah. One, one person wrote in regarding the... The second story has the same title as the book, The Heart of the Matter. And it's actually a long kind of political soliloquy on the country we could have had yeah. as opposed to the one we do. Um, and uh, so um, in a sen- somebody wrote in and said, well, this is fiction, but it's not really fiction. You mm-hmm. know, uh, The models I cite for alternatives to what we have are people like um, uh, John Ruskin, William Morris, Gandhi, Mm -hmm. uh, Chick Kallenbach. You remember Ecotopia? Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. And I I read the prequel as well. Yeah, Ecotopia, yeah. And um, another one was, uh, uh, flips my mind now. Oh, yeah, Lewis Mumford. Oh, yes. I mean, the, these were people that were pursuing a very different vision of what uh, life could be. Mm-hmm. And one of the stories, which is called Moonies, is a bunch of people who get together and work with a, an Elon uh, Musk kind of figure to create a technology that takes them back to a time machine, that takes them back to 1945, and they interrupt uh, the progress on the making of an atomic bomb at Los Alamos. And so on July 17th, when Truman goes to Potsdam uh, to talk with the Russians about uh, the, you know, dividing uh, Germany up into four parts and the post-war world, he can't dictate, because the, the Trinity test never took place. That's amazing. So he can't dictate to the Russians. As a result, Hiroshima is never bombed. The Cold War never gets off the ground. He has to negotiate instead of dictate to them. And uh, the result is um, that they come back, when they come back to present time, uh, the world is the alternative world, the world that should have happened and didn't. And so, what you, you know, nobody has heard of somebody called Ronald Reagan, <laughs> let alone uh, John Foster Dulles. And Lee Stevenson won both elections in 1952 and 56. Uh, there was no bomb. There was no Cold War. Um, they're sitting in a cafe called uh, the Green Earth Cafe or something like that, you know. And um, the uh, last line was one of the one of the women that's part of the group. The last line of the story is Reagan really was an asshole, wasn't he? <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, he was. Anyway, that's the that's the tenor of, of some of the stories, although some of them are, are about love and romance. Uh, there's one story called um, uh, The Gandhi Experiment. You know, this is real. Uh, toward the end of his life, 
uh, Gandhi wanted to um, uh, test his uh, uh, moral strength, I guess, or spiritual strength. So he would lie with uh, young women, you know, about 20 years of age, all of them naked, and he would, he would lie together with them in a bed. Um, and that was to challenge his spiritual strength. And so one of the stories is called the Gandhi Experiment, in which a uh, 24-year-old young woman and an 85-year-old man uh, undertake to uh, do the same thing, but not as a um, not as spiritual strengthening, but as a way of raising their libido. So there's no touching or anything like that, but they experiment with this sort of, and it's a, it's kind of a a sweet tale, mm -hmm. you know. It's kind of a sweet tale of um, uh, of two people who are uh, 70, uh, 60 years apart, and how they fall in love. Oh, I like that. You know, they have snuggle parties. Oh, what a great idea! Yeah, isn't it? It's there's yeah. no sex, there's no unwanted touching. It's they just people come together to snuggle because you know we need human touch. And of course, now with this pandemic, people are really, really suffering because they're not getting enough touches and hugs and snuggles and human contact. Uh -huh. yeah. it's, it's been right. really tough. Do you, do you think that we're in collapse right now? Be, you know, I mean, do you think that this has triggered collapse even more than just the regular <laughs> bad economy that we've been having? The regular collapse. Right. right. <laughs> well, yeah, you know. Um, I mean, you'd have to be pretty blind not to see that we're in the midst of it. Um, as I said, Trump is an icon. How is it that the president of the United States uh, is revealed in an interview as a complete fool? Yeah. Um, but the larger picture is one of, I mean, the, the model I take is, is, which I did in the first book of that American Empire trilogy, Twilight of American culture. The model I take as comparison is that of the late Roman Empire. And it's been said, I can't remember what historian used this phrase, that Rome died the death of a thousand cuts. So any one day seemed like any other day. It wasn't like you woke up and the world was different. But every day there was more of an erosion, more of a cutting away of what the society was about until finally it just drifted off into meaninglessness and nothing. And so my analysis is what I call nodes versus cuts. The cuts go on on a daily basis. The interview with Trump was a cut. Um, a, a woman uh, taking, uh, you know, Walmart screaming and throwing all her groceries around, that's mm -hmm. a cut. Mm -hmm. um, but a node is one that shifts uh, the situation significantly. In the case of Rome, for example, the invasion of the Visigoths in 410 AD, mm -hmm. uh, the sack of Rome, mm -hmm. that was a node. Uh, in our case, it would be uh, the assassinations of the 60s, uh, the defeat in Vietnam, 9-11, uh, right. the crash of 2008. Uh, all of these things are nodes, and there are going to be more nodes in our future. Yeah. Uh, there's no question about that, that we are going to face. I mean, right now we're in a uh, situation of severe economic depression where people are unemployed, they can't get uh, unemployment insurance. Uh, I mean, it's, a, it's really, you know, and the economy is contracted something like 20%, yeah. whatever, that, that's a node. And um, there are going to be more of those, but at the same time, there are going to be more Karens screaming in Walmart, and there are going to be more ridiculous interviews with the president, and there are going to be daily cuts that these things accumulate, these things accumulate. And what I argued in the Twilight book was uh, they really can't be turned around. Yeah. Um, Turning, turning this trajectory around at this point would be like trying to turn around an aircraft carrier in a bathtub. Yeah. It's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. And when I read uh, these endless um, discussions,
discussions of trivia in the in the major papers. You know, well, what's Meghan Markle's hat look like, and <laughs> who is Biden going to pick as a vice presidential candidate? Mm-hmm. All of that fades into utter insignificance when you realize mm-hmm. that the game is over, yeah. and that's the real headline. Yeah, that's the, the, the New York Times should be printing that every day. United States collapses in failure and despair. That should be the daily headline, because that's what's going on. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So it's over, but I'm still having food show up at the grocery store, and if I wear a mask, I can go in there and buy it. And there are many indications that something resembling business as usual is carrying on. So, at, and, and I suspect at least 40% of the people in this country, probably closer to 90%, think that it's no significant change so far and the election is going to make a big difference in terms of where we go from here. What are your thoughts on that? Well, I do think you're right. It's about 90%. I would say about 99% of the country believe that the problem is Trump, and if we just get him out of there and put him by, everything's going to be fine. And I don't know how you wake up uh, progressives, because these are the ones, Democrats, the progressives, the New York Times, and so on, uh, that actually believe that uh, we have a chance, that we, we really can turn things around. I mean, here you have um, the murder of George Floyd, mm-hmm. the rise of, a, you know, increased rise of uh, Black Lives Matter mm-hmm. movement, mm-hmm. protests, demonstrations in the street, and all that sort of thing. And where did it finally wind up, it wound up, it's largely wound up in uh, how we use language, uh, taking down Confederate statues, uh, things that are symbolic rather than real. And if you want, for example, to look at serious changes uh, in the situation of black people, well, sure, I mean, I have no interest in separating uh, bathrooms into colored and white or water fountains. I mean, all that was horrible. But the the economic position of black people in the United States is pretty much the same now as it was in 1950. Right. Before you had Selma and and Martin Luther King and all of that. So what are we really talking about in terms of change? Um, The Rutgers, I used to teach at Rutgers many years ago, Rutgers University department has now decided that English, the grammar of the English language is racist and they're going to have to teach a different type of grammar. You know, when I say Americans are stupid, I'm not just talking about poor people or, you know, I mean, the intelligent people are stupid. Right. How would you, how could you possibly come to, to think, first of all, that that makes any sense at all, and secondly, that that constitutes a social change and a fight against racism? fight against racism, when the dust settles, you can bet that police departments across the country will be doing the same thing they always did. Right. They'll be doing chokeholds, white cops will be killing young black males. Mm-hmm. All of that's going to continue. Uh, so, yeah. so what are we talking about, you know? Um, that, that's, that's what I'm saying about um, uh, it will be business as usual. That's right. Right, and, and as we collapse, it's probably going to get worse as fewer people have money, jobs, housing. Um, it's not going to be very pretty. Our, our country doesn't have a safety network that other countries do, and it may be paralleling, I mean, what the former Yugoslavia and the German Democratic Republic and the USSR may have gone through, although I I suspect ours is going to be a lot uglier. Again, because our people are not cohesive. We don't like to work together. Well, and also as George... Yeah, and it's more... I would say it's more insidious in our case because, uh, like, for example, the collapse of the Soviet Union, that that happened overnight. It was like the collapse of the Mayan Empire, Mayan civilization. These are rare exceptions. Mm -hmm. The usual pattern is mapped out by Arnold Toynbee and other historians of decline 
are the the Roman the Roman model, the the thousand cuts and the nodes, and you sort of limp along until finally there is no more Roman Empire. It's basically ruled by German tribes. Yeah. <laughs> you know, um, I mean that that's going to be our situation. In our case, it won't be German tribes; it'll be the Chinese. And uh, we China, will, China, we China. Will lose prominence. <laughs> Sorry? China, China, China. <laughs> right, yeah. We will lose preeminence. We will lose our hegemony. Uh, Chinese are smart. You know, they think in terms of 40 or 50 years down the line. Mm -hmm. Americans think of four or five years down the line, if only four or five weeks. I, so yeah. what chance do we have in the world? I mean, very, very little. Yeah. You had a question? Oh, yeah. In fact, George Carlin had a famous line about when you realize how stupid the average person is, and then you can you know that half the people are stupider than that. Where do you think this is going to go? Right. right. Yeah, I miss him. George, George had it all figured out pretty much. Yeah. Unfortunately, he was a comedian, not a politician, and he didn't have much sway with politicians either. Well, all of those people got ignored. Um, H. L. Mencken was uh, just, just. I mean, he had a column in the Baltimore newspaper, but he was largely dismissed. Crank. Carlin has been dismissed as a comedian, so it doesn't count. Gore Vidal posed a different kind of problem because he came from an elite family, was friends with John Kennedy, uh, all this sort of thing. But he, his, his um, greatest impact came through his novels rather than his nonfiction writing. And they had some impact, but then again, he could be dismissed as an eccentric. He's a member of the elite. Uh, fighting for the little guy. He's just sort of kind of a center. And of course, I said I follow in that tradition. I'm not even on the radar screen. You know? yeah. I mean, I have absolutely zero following. Well, you know, about 172 people, I think. <laughs> <laughs> well, and it doesn't help that fewer and fewer people read over time, and certainly in the United States. So even though Gore Vidal is almost always an essayist writing short pieces, most people just can't be bothered. As you indicated, the attention span of a gnat. Yeah, and, and they get their news from their cell phones or late night comedians, mm -hmm. you know, things like that. Yeah, but so we just agree that there are some good comedians, right? <laughs> <laughs> Very. I mean, look, I always got a kick out of Jay Leno, you know. He had this section of his program called Jaywalking. Yes. And Jay would, Jay would go out in the streets of Burbank, okay, and he'd walk around and he'd do things like stop somebody and say, when the United States declared its independence in 1776, uh, what, was it, what country was it breaking away from? Answers included China. <laughs> oh, my. Yeah. Or he would say, um, what, uh, when could you tell me? when the war between the states occurred and yeah. the woman he was talking to said, oh, you mean the student rebellions of the 1960s? Oh. A guy oh. with a clipboard stands in front of the Women's Study Center at UC Santa Barbara and he would stop women walking along the street but also coming out of the Women's Study Center and he said, will you sign a petition opposing women's suffrage. <laughs> he asked about 10 women. Eight of them said, of course I'm opposed to women's suffrage. <laughs> and, and two of them had the brains to say, wait a minute, that means women's voting rights, right? Yeah. Eight didn't understand that. They thought yeah. suffrage meant suffering. They had just walked out of classes at the Women's Study Center on 19th, 20th century women's history. What were they doing? Updating their their Facebook profiles? Yeah. So what do you think is, I mean, obviously our educational system in this country is not great. <laughs> but yeah, you might say that. Is, is there anything else? Are, are we just a nation of knuckleheads that don't know how to connect yes. dots? Yeah. Yes, we are. Yeah. Yes, we are. Not only can't Americans connect the dots, they don't even recognize the dots. Right. 
Right. I mean, Reagan typically shows up as the most popular president mm -hmm. when street polls are taken or people are called up and asked, who's your favorite president? I know, the I guy was a knucklehead. It's amazing. I, I can't. I mean, the guy. Yeah. He had Alzheimer's while he was in office. Yeah. <laughs> he made decisions based on his wife's astrologer. <laughs> I know. I know. It's so stunning to me. People still come up with that. Reagan was so great. I'm like, no, he was handsome. That's it. That was it. He was an empty shirt. That's it. Yeah. Uh, That's right. This, well, is, this is what we've had. Jimmy Carter was the only president who actually had a vision, and a vision for the United States that was different. And he articulated that in the speech he gave in July of 1979 at Annapolis, after which members of Congress took to the floor to declare that he must be insane. Yeah. Can I ask you a question? Big lightning. Why not? <laughs> Isn't that what this is all about? <laughs> That's what I thought. Yes. <laughs> you are, you have a, an amazing insight and a clarity of vision. And I was just wondering, like, where did that come from for you? How did that develop? You were, you grew up, I'm assuming you grew up in the U.S. <laughs> I did. I did. I grew up in upstate New York. And I would say that by the age of eight, mm -hmm. I realized, not in an intellectual sense, but I realized in a sort of visceral sense, that I was a stranger in a strange land, uh. that I simply didn't fit. Yeah. And thereupon entered an enormous type of struggle because, you know, children especially, but everybody else around the planet, they want to belong. They want to fit into a place. Mm -hmm. They want friends. They want people who care about them. All of us want that. And I was no exception, except I couldn't get it. Because I simply didn't fit in. Uh, when I was a teenager, every boy I knew was interested in car fins, you know, yeah. Mustang and uh, you know, the fins on cars, you know. <laughs> I thought that was demented. <laughs> and so, so where, where was I going to go. And then as I got older and was able to travel, I noticed that every time I was out of the United States, I felt wonderful. Mm -hmm. You know, it didn't matter where I went, France, Italy, England, it didn't mm -hmm. matter. I felt great. And then I would come back and I would be depressed. Mm -hmm. And so somehow, you know, at a very early age, I understood this was not my country. These were not my values. Mm -hmm. And I have a feeling that a lot of that uh, came from my mother's family who escaped uh, from uh, Russia. The threat was not the Bolsheviks, oh, it was the yeah. Cossacks. Right. They escaped, and this is a, around, it was not around, it was in 1920, mm -hmm. and they came to the United States. And I remember evenings sitting around with them. Uh, they, they were by no means communists, but they were socialists of a sort. Mm -hmm. And above all, above all, they had a wicked sense of humor. That's great. Americans don't. They're grim people. And I understand that goodness. I understand the source of their goodness. But they are not funny people. Yeah. Um, progressives are angry. The Bubba's are angry. The Karens are angry. Yeah. Who in America isn't angry? And, you know, I mean, very typically, when... I would be in a store, let's say, in the United States. Actually, uh, Tina Fey did a good job of parodying this in her movie, Mean Girls, which is a great film. But yes. you'd be in a store, and you come to the cashier, and you crack a joke, and they just stare at you. <laughs> they have no idea where you're coming. Do you want sex? Do you want money? What, what's up? You know? When I crossed the border into Mexico in 2006, 30 miles in, I stopped at a gas station that was also a huge cafeteria. And I hadn't had lunch, and I went in. And I, so I'm in the cafeteria line. And there were teenagers that were, you know, working there and running the cashier and the cash register and so on. And I made a joke in Spanish. They came back immediately with their own. Wow. And I thought, these, these kids are alive. Yeah. These 
kids are alive. American kids are dead. Yeah. yeah well, that's, an, that's another hour gone by. Thank you very much, Professor Morris Berman, for joining us today. Well, I certainly hope I've depressed everybody. <laughs> In my job, that's my job, you know, it's my unofficial work. So. <laughs> well, we're famous as being doomers, so. <laughs> I don't think you're going right, to depress see. anybody right, on this show. Have a great time in the Grand Canyon. Thank you Thank so you. much. All viruses. Thank you. And uh, we'll talk again down the line, eh? Yes, you, please. You Thank you well. very much. Stay healthy and stay awesome. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Berman. I'm having a good time. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye now. Thank you for listening to today's pre-recorded show. You can catch NBL on PRN the first Tuesday afternoon of each month at 3 p.m. Eastern. The next episode is scheduled for October 6th in the United States. If you miss the broadcast, you can find shows in the archives at prn.fm, the Podbean, or at Stitcher. And please feel free to rate us on iTunes. We encourage rating us highly. Also, continue to follow the Nature Bats Last blog, GuyMcPherson.com. For further updates, interviews, and speaking tours, you can keep current with Kevin's work at KevinHester.live. Thanks again to our guest, Professor Morris Berman, our listeners, and also to Afrizen for his awesome music. Until next time, remember, the dominant culture has been very clever, but in the end, Nature Bats Last. She's as last and she's just about taking all that she can take And it's payback time It's payback time I said it's payback time It's payback time Every year of my life, that's almost 52 years so far, the world has become a worse and worse place. Every year we have polluted more water than the year before. Every year there's been less clean air than there was the year before that. Every year there are fewer and fewer species on the planet than the year before that. We're driving 200 species a day into extinction. We're about to see that turn around. The living planet is about to make a comeback. And that's really, really good news. She bats last and she's coming out swinging. She bats last and she's just about taking all that she can take. And it's payback time. It's payback time. I said it's payback time. It's payback time. For the strip mine plans, for the boys in seas, for the acid rain, for another dead species, for GMO, for uranium all, for screwing your kids for a few dollars more. Now it's payback time. It's payback time. The loving planet is about to make a comeback. The loving planet is about to make a comeback. The loving planet is about to make a comeback. And that's really, really good news.